Okay, this, this will serve as the first official short uh, on the subject of um, dispensational and amillennial objections um, and answering some of those questions. And um, as I said, I would do the introduction. I thought it would be best to address some of the questions of hermeneutics, um, although, as I said, I will still be addressing that within each individual question. But there's there's one aspect of it that has to be addressed first, and, and that is... Um, that both camps will accuse one another of an inconsistent hermeneutic, okay? A couple of $2 words that simply means the uh, dispensational camp will, will accuse the amillennialist or the reformed camp of not having a consistent hermeneutic. The um, reformed camp, they do such a super great job um, in so many doctrinal and theological issues and are so detailed in particular about um, parsing scripture the correct way. But then um, where it comes to um, eschatology, things that have, have to do with the end times, um, will fall on symbolism, some more than others, um, but they will fall back on a form of literature that they will call um, apocalyptic literature, and, and many in the dispensation, probably most in the dispensational camp, also will say, will agree, yeah, there's apocalyptic literature. Um, so, you know, I'm not among them, and I'll explain why. But, um, and it's a more recent thing, but I kind of, um, I've kind of backed way off on that. Um, like I say, I'll explain why, but I digress. The other way around, too, is, is the, um, Reformed camp, the Amil and post mill, will point the finger at the dispensational groups and say, well, you're not consistent in your hermeneutic because you believe in the literal. And um, let's talk about what consistent hermeneutic and literal means and doesn't mean. Now, the, the accusation that comes towards, the, and I say comes towards because I put myself in the camp of dispensational, um, I'm premillennial. I am free trib. Yeah. Oh no, your hair can go on fire now. And um, but I'm also something that I call restorationist dispensation. What's restorationist? You've probably never heard that term. Probably not. I just came up with it in the last couple of weeks. I don't know what else to call it. Um, no, it's not restorationist as far as like in the in the charismatic camp. What you you'll have is you'll have a restorationist type of a movement that has to do with people coming out of demon possession and some out of something. If no, it's not that one. This has to do with eschatology this has to do with when the new heaven and new earth occurs which i i will part ways with dispensationalism traditional dispensationalism but so far any dispensationalism i've seen so far in that, in that respect is that um you know i've, I've um, come to the conclusion that the new heaven and new earth and jerusalem coming down all of that happens um at the beginning of the kingdom period um after the tri tribulation period after the great tribulation and there are various reasons why I just did a, a couple of videos on that subject on YouTube uh, under the subject of uh, you know getting into Revelation chapter 19, 20, and 21. Not so much. I, I guess I, I've, I've frequently said Revelation chapter 20 is parenthetical. Maybe parenthetical is not the correct term. I tend to think more like Revelation 20 and Revelation 21 run parallel. Revelation 20 being more of an overview of a thousand year period. It mentions the thousand six times so i'm going to say thousand the text has not given me good reason to read any symbolism into that so thousand means a thousand is it names it six times and it's on all in the context of time so i'm just going to let's just go with that the only time i'll run to symbolism is if is if the literal does not work well there's no reason for me to believe that the literal does not work there so i'm going to stick to um i'm, I'm going to stick to the literal there so not, and not run into symbolism um so Chapter 21 will bring the narrative back immediately after chapter 19 because you've got um, the second coming of Christ. We've discussing the marriage supper of the Lamb happening. And then um, we go immediately from there to chapter 21 where it's, and, um, and there I saw a new heaven, new earth. And, and um, we've got Jesus making all things new, which if the tribulation is true and all the things that just happened in, in the great tribulation in particular with the bowl judgments happen. He's going to have to do some restoration before you even go into the kingdom, right? 
So why would you go from there and, and then restore or Second Peter 3, nuke everything, completely blow everything up and start all over again from whole cloth at the end of a millennium? And if there's a time you need to do it, it would be at the beginning of the millennium. But anyway, I'll explain all that. It might be confusing. It might sound confusing, but I've got videos that run about an hour long and we discuss this and I have a discussion in front of a group and we go through the various verses and you'll find out the reasons why. So again, it's, that's me trying to take it even more literal than, than maybe what other dispensationalists do. So again, so with the literalism, the accusation is that we, you guys aren't literal where you need to be literal. The dispensationalists will say, well, I'm not saying literalism meaning absolute literal because rightly um, he covers thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou rest. God is not Big Bird. Uh, there is symbolic language in the scripture. And um, dispensational will, will agree with that. And um, now sometimes it'll be a matter of the timing. Well, how come you take it literally here, but you're not going to take it literally? What, and they'll mock sometimes, and the tone can get really ugly. They'll mock sometimes and say, oh, yeah, what about the great big red dragon in the book of Revelation, and it's got seven heads and ten horns? Well, um, the way that the dispensationists would or should, the ones who are doing it correctly, <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, I don't mean to be condescending. Um, but sometimes I won't be sarcastic. But uh, sometimes you got to be condescending because you got to kind of come down and say, really? Because that's just ridiculous. So uh, I think it's okay to do that. Paul did it a few times. So um, since I'm not talking to anybody personally and I'm not, I'm not addressing anybody specific or directly, then I can be that way a little bit, right? Um, it's all in good fun. I'm trying to have fun with this and trying to educate two different camps at once a little bit here and share my perspective. But uh, here's the funny thing about the great red dragon and taking that literally in the book of Revelation. And as I said, um, you know, uh, let me speak for myself. There is symbolism in the book of Revelation. There's, there's metaphor in the book of Revelation. Where you got to come down on symbolism and decide that, well, it's symbolic, is that there's nothing like that in nature, right? So if there's nothing like that in nature, that should give you pause. If it gives you pause, you should say, well, wait, how do I interpret this? I mean, God is God. He can do whatever he wants. And if he wants to plop a big red dragon on the earth, he could true but here's the thing is what does the text say so you can context 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 it's like real estate and marketing so far uh the location 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 it's like that context it's all about context um the text says it's symbolic that helps you read a few verses later and it says and here's the meaning the dragon is this and then it describes you know what the horns are and what the heads are and and then it'll give it in different terms as well in terms of other beasts and things and so it gives it to you uh, you know, in two or three different ways so that you understand um, what um, is is um, being communicated, okay? We understand the language of the psalm where it says, he gathers thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou rest. And God is like a mother hen um, and protecting you. Then that's what they'll do. It's, it could be hailing outside and the mother hen is getting beat on the head with hail, but she's got her feathers out, her wings out over her chicks and she's protecting them. And that's the imagery that God is trying to convey. Um, it helps to understand Hebraisms in, in the Jewish language and Jewish writings, they use, um, they'll use exaggerative language a lot. And my mom used to use exaggerative language for me. And I always give this example where folks who hear my Bible studies get tired of it. My mother used to say things to me like, um, if I have to tell you one more time, I'm going to slap you into the middle of next week. Uh, or we'll say things like, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Um, so we use exaggerative languages as well. Sometimes the, the ones that are in the scripture might be lost on us because it's not from our culture. So it helps to know the culture a little bit and to, and to get into that. Um, authorial intent does have meaning, but the real author intent, authorial intent that has meaning is the Holy Spirit's because the writers didn't always know what they were writing. We have Daniel saying things like, it troubled me. I didn't know what I was saying. So God told Gabriel, you know, Gabriel, explain it to the boy, which is he knows what I'm talking about, how this must come down. So sometimes on faith, there were times, particularly with prophetic writings, um, notice I said prophetic writings and not apocalyptic literature. In prophetic writings, they didn't always know um, exactly what the meaning was, but they were obedient to the Holy Spirit and they wrote what, their, what the Lord was telling them to write. Um, that's the way it worked among the prophets and the apostles. But the literal versus the, the, literal versus the, um, the figurative uh, um, with the language. We have to go... Um, in some cases, you have to go text by text, look at the context, look at what's being said. And what we also have to do, 
very, very important, especially when you're looking at like the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible that was written. You gotta look at everything that was that goes before it. Um, and most of the time we find an example of that language that's used that's so confusing in the Old Testament. Uh, there is a text in the Old Testament. Well, in, in let me back up. In Revelation, um, it talks about how the Lord will rescue Israel on the wings of a great eagle, right? And bear them out of the country, rescue them basically from the man of sin, the man of perdition, a.k.a. the Antichrist, as people will call him. So rescues him, flies him out to the land of Edom and Moab, which the Old Testament says that's going to be an area of refuge in the Old Testament. Um, and it's it's modern-day Jordan area. Um, a lot of people say Petra. Why not? I don't know it could be. It's going to be a divine, supernatural protection anyway because they've got missiles that can hit Petra, but God will says he's going to protect them. In the Old Testament, it says that he will protect them there. So, folks will point out that happened in 70 AD. Well, it happened a little bit in 70 AD as well. Here's another nuance of Bible prophecy, and that is near and far fulfillments, or partial fulfillments will be near, and a more complete fulfillment will be later, where it might even back up to the beginning and then complete what you saw a little bit historically and then finish up the rest of it. Um, you say, Dave, give me an example. Um, Jesus, one of his first sermons or lessons he did was in the temple, you recall, and he opened up the scroll of Isaiah and he read partway through Isaiah and then he stopped at a comma, I might put it that way. Um, it's not called a comma in Hebrew, but anyway, he stopped at a comma, he stopped at a pause, at a break, and rolled it up and said, this day this is fulfilled, you know, in your midst. And the rabbis were looking at each other, what is this about? Everybody didn't know, because he didn't finish the passage. Well, the, the passage was split in two. One was um, about Christ's, um, you know, Jesus Messiah, about his first advent, his first coming. And the other referred to very specific judgments and deliverance and so forth that had to do with his second coming. So there you have a break in the prophecy. And, and this type of thing happens sometimes. Um, how about the abomination of desolation? That's controversial. We will address that. Um, so Daniel gets this prophecy about the abomination of desolation from Gabriel. Um, did that happen? Well, it turned out it did happen. In the intertestamental period, it did happen. Uh, and Antiochus um, Epiphanes went to the temple. He slaughtered a pig on the altar. He erected a statue of Zeus, and it did not go well. So that was the abomination of desolation. And folks historically look at that and say, yeah, it happened. But if you look at the rest of the passage of Daniel, the whole thing did not happen. And in fact, in the Olivet Discourse, um, famously Matthew 24, you will find where Jesus addresses that. And he's talking about, he's answering a threefold question from the disciples. Again, we'll talk about that in the future. But he he's answering these questions, and he's answering them in the order that they were asked. And part of that was, um, part of Christ's answer was, so when you see the abomination that makes desolate that Daniel spoke about, so he's addressing it as if it's future. Well, wait, Jesus, that happened 200 years before you. And you're saying, we're supposed to watch for it. So when you see this happen, so it's yet future. Um, and then there's echoes of that um, again. Folks will point to 70 AD and say, yeah, it happened in 70 AD. Well, is that the complete fulfillment? Even if you say part of it happened then too, and there's an echo in 70 AD, was it completely accomplished then? A couple schools of thought. One is the historicist or historical view of end times. There are others, but these are the two main camps. And one is futurist. Um, the futurist camp is no, it hasn't happened completely and literally um, yet, so therefore it must be out into the future. So. Those are the camps, those are the arguments, those are the struggles. And I'm, I'm hoping as I address these issues, um, for instance, now I'm trying to talk um, about hermeneutics and the, the couple of different perspectives, just for context and how people will do it, how people will address it. So I, um, I will say that there is symbolism. The question comes down to, did it get answered completely and entirely? And how do we couch it in terms? Because we have to admit that the same author is the author of all, right? Talking about, again, going back to authorial intent. The Holy Spirit, ultimately, is the author of the entire scriptures, Old Testament and New, and it all matters. We don't interpret the old against the new and the new against the old, of which have, um, you know, primary significance or placement. And some people today are saying, oh, you can ignore the Old Testament. That's not even 
that's done that they're in the New Testament period now. So now we just look at the New Testament. No, we just the same author is the author of all. And can we agree that God lives? He lives. He exists outside of time. So when he authors this, it it's not on a timeline of, you know, A B C D all the way to Z necessarily. He lays things out that way to us, but he's not revealing himself to us in in those terms. Um, he doesn't. What I'm saying is. He doesn't come to realize things bit by bit and expose them to him in the order that he realizes things are going to happen or in, in a timeline that he decides he's how he's going to do it and he exposes it to us that way god had the whole plan of redemption laid out before the foundations of the world you know, we, we see that in ephesians chapter one for instance but um, god is all-knowing so he knows the entire past the entire present the entire future he knows all things um he is eternal so he exists outside of time so all the scripture is important so we weigh scriptures against each other god does not change his mind he's not going to come along later and say yeah i don't i, I didn't like that plan this is plan b i like this better so god um when he gave us the scripture he gave it to us in the order he decided to give it to us knowing what he was going to reveal to us later and it all hangs together and no two scriptures should contradict if you find a passage that contradicts what you understand or what you've read before then the problem probably lies with me i must be reading it and understanding it incorrectly so i've got to reconcile it an example that i, I mentioned earlier second peter chapter three grappling with that uh, uh, so and i did come to a conclusion and i just um last night um, second to the last bible study in the book of revelation in revelation chapter 21 i went into that with with um the folks that were here and and in the previous week going into revelation chapter 20. So kind of going through and helping them understand how I've come to some of the conclusions I have. And um, I, I, nobody picked up stones to throw them at me or anything like that. So um, I take that as a good sign. You know, if, if, you, if you land on a unique novel idea, that should give you pause, of course. And you say, well, nobody else is saying this. I need to really think about this. So is this the right way to look at it? So you dig deeper. You be the Berean, be like the Bereans. And you dig deeper and you're, you test yourself against the word. You don't proof text. Say, well, let me see if I can find a text here that proves that and this here, and I'll put them all together. And let me grab this one over here that I like. I'll plug this in here and tell it it works. No, it should all hang together. And the scriptures should be drawn out from within their context, and they should stay in their context when you're um, testing your notions as you reform, as you develop in Christ. Um, so these, that's, that's, that's the big talk on, on hermeneutics in the two different camps. And just the exhortation on both sides to um, re-examine themselves and how they approach Scripture. I was about ready to say the Reform camp. What I've noticed was um, many of them have stopped reforming, but the dispensationalists have too, in the sense that we go to church, we get something from on high from a pastor, or from a Bible school uh, teacher, or from a Sunday school teacher, and we comfortable with that. So I'm going to stick with that put a nail in that and a hammer right there and i'm sticking to my guns no matter what yeah there are, are people who are very knowledgeable who've gone on before you want to put a lot of weight to the number of years and study that they put into a matter but it ain't the gospel so god be willing to shred that off the, the reformers let's face it they were coming out of the roman catholic church um, lots of bad ideas that they were trying to change they didn't get very far and they got into issues having to do with um, distribution of the bible reading the bible encouraging the masses um, the regular folk to read the Bible and, and trying to make um, everyday language available to the masses and understand salvation issues primary. And they didn't get very far um, as mostly young men. They all died relatively young. It's on us to continue that tradition and keep reforming as they would have and not camp out somewhere because, well, this guy said it first. You know, whose camp talked about what issue first? Who talked about uh all millennials and first who was the first author the dispensational camp will, will go and try to find somebody even earlier who said something first so first one on gets it gets the argument wins the argument this kind of thing now yours was later this was much later you didn't you didn't uh this camp nobody thought this way until darby came along in the 1800s which is which is absurd um as it comes down to whichever camp you're in if it's in the bible the bible was there first first one on okay so that argument needs to just go away and we need to get into the scripture um, we can weigh what the writings of learned men, but we shouldn't camp out there. We should, um, like I said, be ever ready to reform and continue reforming. And so 
um, come let us reason together. Let's look at the scripture um, in light of context, draw whatever conclusions and leave the rest of the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit um, as we continue to read scripture over the years and, and pray over matters. 